All right, on the front page you see a note here. There's free student counseling that the college offers. If you need to talk to them about anything, then uh, I strongly encourage you to do so. Even if the problem is at another school. I had somebody who was having problems with a professor at another school, um, pretty serious problems, and the counselors here um, contacted the people there, and they resolved the situation. So these are good people. So what we're going to do, let's see, I did start the recorder, did I? Yay, okay. What we're going to do is dive into our textbook, How to Think Like a Computer Scientist, which you can find in contents or in the quick links to the site. Alrighty, so we're going to plow through some of this pretty quickly, as we've already talked about this stuff. But this is our textbook, so you're expected to read this on your own time and uh, be familiar with the material. If I skip something, I'm, I'm not going to ask you about it on the exam, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good idea to know it. Generally, I only give tests over stuff that I cover in class. That seems fair to me. All right, Python is a high-level language. Other languages that are high-level languages are C++, C Sharp, Java. There are also low-level languages, which is just the machine code, or the, the zeros and the ones, or the assembly that you can write that will turn into the zeros and the ones in, when you compile it. So computers can only execute programs that are written in low-level languages. Those are actually the codes, the numeric codes, that drive the processor. But when you write a program, it gets turned into a low-level code. It gets translated into it through a process called compiling and interpreting. There are compiled languages and then there are inter uh, interpreted languages. Compiled languages are like C++ that are distributed as executables. Interpreted languages are things like Python, where you can just copy the text and send it straight to them. You don't, you're not distributing, it, distributing an .exe file, an application. Instead, you're giving them a .py script. You're giving them a script which is just, you know, you can open up in Notepad. So the advantage to high-level languages is that they are portable. If you're using a low-level language, it's just the machine code that drives a specific processor and a specific operating system. If you take your machine code .exe and you try to run it on a Mac, it's not going to work unless you install an emulator. Maybe you all know what emulators are. Maybe you've played with video game emulators so that you can play your Nintendo stuff on your PC or whatever. That works the same way. You know, the Nintendo cartridge, the ROM file that you download, is machine language and it requires an emulator in order to run it on, you know, your phone or, uh, you know, a computer or whatever. Otherwise, you can't because machine code is not portable, however high-level languages are. Now there's some cases where the high-level language is not portable. If you're writing a C++ program and you're using commands that are going to open up windows on the, uh, on the Windows screen and stuff like that, that's going to be totally different than what it looks like if you write the same code to display windows on the Mac or on Linux. So uh, it's not totally portable, some languages are pretty much totally portable. Python's totally portable. I haven't run into anything that runs on Windows only in Python. Java, also totally portable. Portable meaning that it'll run on either platform, no problems. Okay, we've launched the Python interpreter before. That's called the shell. The arrows are called the prompt. So if you come over here to the start box and type Python, Eventually, it'll launch our little window, I hope. There we go. Looks just like it did when we launched idle. As a matter of fact, it did launch idle. That's pretty neat. Not what I was expecting. But anyways, that's the Python shell. You type commands in, print 1, 2, 3, plus 4, 3, you get an immediate response. You don't write your scripts in this window, but you can type commands into it. 
That's way different than a compiled language like C++ or Java. You don't get a window like this where you can say things like system.out.println, hello. That's a Java command, but there's absolutely no place in a Java environment where you can type that command and have it work. You have to put it in a program. Same with C++. If you want to say the word hello on the screen in C++, you do something like this. Looks quite a bit different than our stuff, this little business about the arrows. C++ is kind of an odd beast. Incredibly useful to learn, though. But there's no place in the C++ environment. Like if you download Visual Studio or you have Xcode on the Mac, anything that works with C++, you can't just type commands in like that and get an immediate response. That is one difference between a scripted language and, an, and a compiled language. So, this is our shell. This is called the prompt. We're not going to really do very much in the shell or in the prompt. Whenever I tell you to start typing in a program, you're always going to do file, new file. We've already been doing all this, so, like I said, we're going to go through this first chapter pretty quickly. Wrong clicker. Okay, if you want, you can download PyScripter. It's a different development environment. The more development environments you know, the better. I'm never going to require you to use PyScriptor. There's another one installed on these machines called PyCharm. We might explore it. But by and large, since idle is the one that comes with Python, it's pretty much guaranteed to be there on any computer with Python installed on it. These other things you have to install. So, you know, I prefer idle unless we have a strong reason to use another one. What is a program? It's a sequence of instructions that tells the computer what to do, how to perform a computation. Might be mathematical, might be something else, symbolic computations like it. you're going to, oh, finally, go away, pie charm. Stop. Okay. Like if you have a text file full of words and you want to search and replace on it or you want to count the number of times that the letter A it occurs in it. That's kind of more of a symbolic computation than um, doing a math equation. So generally the processes you learn when you're learning how to program are always going to be how do you get stuff into the computer, into the program, whether you get it from a keyboard or a file or some other device over the internet, output, how do you write it to a file? How do you display something on the screen? The math functions. How to do conditional executions. Those are the if statements. And how to repeat something over and over. A loop. Pretty much that's all there is to it. Yeah, but you sure can't do a lot with that stuff. Everything you play on a computer, every game, every uh, application you load is based on these concepts. Debugging. Debugging is a skill that you will learn. It's the art of figuring out what's wrong. Why is there stuff wrong? Somebody asked me the question once in one of these classes. Is, why are we putting all these bugs into our programs in the first place? Mm -hmm. I was like, um, we don't want to put bugs in there. They just happen. <laughs> so, yeah. Programming is complex and it's done by humans. You know, ever since the 70s or whatever, people thought that computers were going to start writing the programs. And I don't know if I ever want to be around when the computers are writing their own programs. That sounds scary to me. Yeah. So, anyways, they're done by humans. They have errors in them. They're called bugs. The process of tracking them down is called debugging. That term predates computers, actually. But the first computer bug. Here we go. Grace Hopper, an incredibly influential computer scientist, in one of her journals, taped a moth to her notebook. And it said the f first bug, the first actual case of a bug being found. <laughs> what had happened is uh, she was working on a mechanical computer, you know, that had relays, you know, mechanical switches in it. And, uh, you know, a moth got caught in the switches and the program stopped working. But the term existed even before computers, you know, electrical engineers would talk about, you know, there's there's a bug in the circuit or something like that. But a bug is when your program doesn't work, and you've all heard that term. 
uh, a bug crash my program or something like that. Generally it means a small engineering difficulty. Oh, I don't know, even a big one. But uh, this says that it dates back to Edison when Edison had a bug with his phonograph. I wonder if he had a bug in his phonograph. You know, they, they, there were those wax cylinders with a needle on it. I can see a bug getting caught in that. Anyways, we've talked about two different kinds of errors so far. Syntax errors and what I called logic errors in one place, I believe. Semantic errors. Syntax errors, you know what those are. That's when you type something and it just doesn't understand it. I'm over here in the shell. That's a syntax error. It's perfectly good syntax for C++, but it's not for Python. So there's no way it'll work. If I put that in a script file, it's not going to work. Then there are semantic errors. Semantic errors are if you put the code in, but it doesn't work the way you want it to. If, okay, like this, temperature is equal to 10 degrees. It's and negative 10 degrees. It's pretty cold. So if the temperature is greater than 32, print, it's freezing. It didn't print anything. Why? Because the equation should have been less than 32. So that's a semantic error. The logic is wrong. It didn't give me any red garbage like this, but the logic was wrong. Then there's a third kind, which you might mistake for a syntax error, but it's not. What if you do something like this? A is equal to somebody typed in a number. And let's do this. Age is equal to suppose somebody thought that they were supposed to type in a, a date for their age. And then you try to convert that to an int or a float. Age is equal to int age. It can't do it. Why? The data is formatted incorrectly. If this was in a program, you wouldn't find the error unless the data was incorrect, unless it hit a state that it didn't understand. It's not a syntax error. This is perfectly good syntax for assigning a variable and for trying to turn it into an int. What's wrong with it is that the wrong kind of data was passed to it. It didn't understand that data. It didn't know how to handle it, so it blew up. As you learn more about programming, it becomes your responsibility, your duty, to reduce Runtime errors. Runtime errors can be things like I couldn't open the file. You know, you type in a wrong file name into Excel, you'd be real annoyed if it displayed a red error message and then quit. Instead, you wanted to say file not found and let you pick another file. So runtime error is when it displays a message and it quits. You know, you're running a Windows program and it says this program has performed an illegal action and Windows has killed it or whatever the terminology is nowadays. That's a runtime error. Something happened that shouldn't have, that it did not expect. And that's different, really, than a logic error. There's no bad logic in here. It's trying to do what we told it to do. It just couldn't. Same thing for opening a file. If you can't open a file to read from or write to, then if you try to read from it or write to it, you're going to get a runtime error. And there are ways to fix these things so that they don't crash your program. And as a responsible programmer, you learn how to do that because users don't want their program blowing up just because it couldn't open a file or just because their connection to the Internet was temporarily interrupted. You know, if I'm uh, using Google and then all of a sudden, for some reason, my Internet connection goes down, I get a message to that effect, you know, here. That's good programming. Instead of just the application quitting, and I'm back at the desktop wondering what happened. You know, that's bad programming. You want to make your programs robust, able to withstand error conditions. Experimental debugging. Experimental debugging is when you're looking at your code trying to figure out what's wrong with it. Although it can be frustrating, debugging is one of the most intellectually rich, challenging, and interesting parts of programming. In some places, you can get a job as a maintenance programmer. And what the maintenance programmer does is he fixes, she fixes bugs in it. You know, you may have one team who's writing the new code, and then you have some maintenance programmers who fix the problems. That sounds kind of annoying. 
but uh, you know you learn the code base that way and then you may get promoted to the people who are writing the new code you also have testing departments who are people who don't even program but they test finding bugs and depending upon the the, uh, the place where you work and the complexity of the stuff that you're doing they may have access to the source code and they may find errors for you but it's your responsibility to fix the debuggers the testers don't find a problem I mean they don't fix the problems they just report them for some people programming and debugging are the same thing programming is a process of gradually debugging a program until it does what you want it to do the idea is that you should start with a program that does something and make small modifications for example Linux is an operating system kernel it contains millions of lines of code but it started off as an itty bitty little program that Linus Torvalds used because he wanted to experiment with an, with an Intel chip one of his very first projects was a program that would display AAAA and then BBBB and now your Linux which you know is used even on IBM mainframes it's just used all over the place on servers and, and it's everywhere you start small then you build up the thing you don't really want to do is to write 200 lines of code and then save it and start trying to run it you start small you get it working then you add a little bit you get a little bit more and it's kind of like a snowball it gets bigger and bigger and bigger if you just took a giant armload of snow and tried to roll it you probably wouldn't be able to do it but if you start with a compacted one and roll it it gets larger we're going to skip the idea of formal versus natural languages formal languages are just ones that have a very rigorous syntax used for scientific or mathematic purposes natural languages are the ones that people speak and it's kind of an interesting challenge trying to convert one to the other you're talking to hey Google or, or you know Siri or whatever half the time they don't know what you're trying to say the English language is so vague the syntax can be so weird that sometimes they can't figure it out our first program we've done this print hello world the quotes in Python you can use single or double quotes in other languages you can only use double quotes there and you put single quotes if you're dealing with a single letter like the letter C or a single digit like one or any of the symbols a dollar sign or whatever those are called characters and this is called a string a string is just a series of characters you can have a string which has no characters at all that's called an empty string I can come over here and type name is equal to that like what if a user was filling in a web form and they didn't feel like, feel like telling you their name then when you print out the name you get nothing makes sense that's an empty string there's no data in it so of course you pop up an error message and the next thing they do is type you know whatever no way or I don't know or you know President Obama or whatever you know people fill in because they don't really want to fill in their name that's an empty string it's still a string it's just like the uh, the value zero it's still a number it's just a number that doesn't have any magnitude to it so comments you use comments in order to describe your program and every program you write every program you turn in I want you to put your name on top of it even if it's a daily assignment and I forget to do it myself just put your name and the date at the top of it if it's homework put a short description of what it does don't just say homework two instead say homework to this converts from ounces to grams or whatever blank lines most languages ignore blank lines you just put them in there to make it easy to read just like if you're reading a book if there are blank lines between the paragraphs it's easier to spot the paragraphs all right here's a glossary I'm gonna skip it mostly there's a few words that are useful parse Parsing is when you take something apart and figure out its individual components. Kind of like diagramming a sentence. And heaven knows I don't remember how to diagram a sentence anymore. But <laughs> Vegetables are disgusting. 
this is the root of the sentence. Then, you know, there, there's the subject, there's the verb. A larger sentence, the green vegetables are always disgusting and I hate them. You know, this is a sentence that has been parsed into its individual components. And if you're trying to understand what it means, if you're trying to tell a computer what it means, it has to know the, the difference between nouns and verbs and stuff like that. We're not going to write stuff like that, but there are other places where parsing comes into play. What if you're given a file that looks like this? Joe... 10, 20, 1990, Bob, 11, 1, 2001. You know, it's a series of dates, names and dates. Beth, February 2, there we go. And then you want to fill out or you want to calculate some stuff based on this stuff. Like you want to display their ages or something in a program. Your code would read this in. Okay, now I have a variable equal to that. And then it has to figure out, okay, I want the name to go into there. You know, but you can't cut, the code's not cutting and pasting. And then you want the birthday to have this part of it. And maybe you want to turn those into numbers. Like month is equal to 10, day is equal to 20 year is equal to 1990. With that information you could you could print out their age. The act of taking that string that we had and digesting it into its individual components, the name and the month and the day and the year, is called parsing. So if I use that word that's all it means. It means taking something that's larger and breaking it down into little bits. Into, small, into useful information that the computer understands. Computer languages also have to be parsed. If you write this, if A is equal to 10, print hello. Python has to go through and go, oh, that's an if statement. I know what I'm supposed to do here. Ah, the next thing after the if statement has to be a comparison followed by a colon. The colon indicates the end of the sentence, and so I know that the stuff between the word if and the colon is a comparison and that evaluates to true and false. So, you know, it takes your code apart and turns it into machine language behind the scenes, which is, again, compiling. But it's also parsing. It has to be parsed before it can be compiled. Parsing is taking something and then making meaning out of it, as far as the computer is concerned. I love that. Okay. Portability, the property of a program to run on more than one computer. If we ever hear the word token, it just means a piece of something that's being parsed. That's a token. That's another token. Or maybe we consider that a token and that a token and that a token. I'm not going to use that word a lot to begin with, but you may hear it later, or more likely, you're going to read it in a text. A token is just a subcomponent of a larger piece of data. So if you're parsing it, you're finding tokens in it. All righty. We're done with Chapter 1. We're awesome. Chapter 2, Variables, Expressions, and Statements. So here we go. We've talked about floats. We know what floats are. Floats contain fractional values. Even if it's 3.0, that's different than an integer. 3.0 is not the same thing as 3, although computer language usually understands that those are equivalent. If you do this, A is equal to 3.0, and you do B is equal to 3, these are stored inside the memory of the computer as completely different formats. This is stored as a mantissa and an exponent. So it really boils down to 3 times 10 to the power of 0. That's the way it's stored, except what's worse is these are binary versions of the numbers. And then um, this is stored just as a pure number. 
if you look at this and this, you can tell probably that the computer is putting them in its memory and saving them to the disk as completely different things. But the language is supposed to be smart enough that if you do this, if A is equal to B, one of these will be converted to the other format in order for them to be compared. What will actually happen is that the integer gets converted into a floating point type so that two floating point types can be compared. Why? Because what if this is 3.1? It could not be converted cleanly to an int to do that comparison, but 3 can be converted cl cleanly to floating point. So why aren't all numbers stored as floating points? Yeah, that's a question for another lecture. Integers are, are things that don't get rounding errors. And what I mean by that, I, did I demonstrate a rounding error already? close this shell and come back. Or I'll just paste it here. Print that. I'm going to call this R error. You do not have to type this in. Now when I run it, Okay, if I type this equation into and paste it into a calculator or some mathematical thing with some better control over rounding errors like Google, it displays that. I suppose that's an accurate answer. Look what Python displayed. And it's not because Python's a bad language. Just pretty much all computer languages do this with floating point calculations. Definitely not the same thing. The difference is very, very small, but it's definitely not the same thing. What the re it, pardon? What does it do if it has an infinity like 0.333? I mean, does it stop at some point? Or well, yeah, on? if you do this, a is equal to 1 divided by 3, print a. It has to stop at a certain point. And in reality, that might be a fun one to try. Print, or b is equal to a times 3. Print b. Let's see if that equals 1 like we would expect. Well, it did that time. That's not a good enough example of a rounding error. But just like 0.333 never ends, some values, when you convert them into binary and you're trying to get the value past the decimal point, also never end. Even if they end cleanly, in base 10, they don't end cleanly in base 2. And then if you're starting to add them or subtract them or multiply them, it gets rounding errors. And it's not because the language is stupid. It's just because floating point math is inexact. And if you're dealing with something like this, it rounds the answer before it displays it. You can be reasonably sure that when the Google's computers did this calculation that it did the same thing and it had some rounding error. But if you look at your output and you see like three or four zeros in a row, you can just chop it off there, and then it looks precise. So there are ways to get around rounding errors. You can only display a certain thing. Well, I'm going to display all my answers to three decimal points. Then the user never sees that point oh, 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 009 or whatever. Integers don't get rounding errors like that. You never add 5 and 10 and get 15.0001. So, integers are good for things that have to be whole numbers. That's why you don't just store everything as a floating point. I don't like this so much I'm saving it.
these really haven't been good, very good notes right now, but know the difference between an int, a float, and a string. We've already talked about that enough, right? Somebody shake their head no so I can blather for another 10 minutes. Okay. Variables are things that hold values. A is equal to 3. And I know I've already said that a variable has a name, and I misspelled that, of a type. Come on. And a value. We use that to have the computer remember things. The score, your score in a video game. How many lives you have left, how many bullets you fire, what the health of your character is, you know, all that kind of stuff. The score of a football game, the current temperature, how many seconds have elapsed since midnight. You know, all of that is data that you may need for some reason. Also, things like names, you know, text data is, can also be stored in a variable. And if somebody types in their first and last name and then they want to type in their zip code, you know, their zip code gets stored as a variable. The state also gets stored as a variable, even though it's not a number. Underneath it all, everything is numbers. But, uh, you know, certain numbers are treated in certain ways so that they can be presented as text on our screen. There are some words that you can't use as variables, names. Those are the words that light up as orange when we're, when we're typing them. And that's a stupid explanation, but it's a good remembrance. You know, if 32 is equal to 64, colon, print, A. Now that's moronic, but if is a keyword. It defines the language. Every language has a set of keywords. A lot of them share a lot of keywords. You know, because a lot of languages, you know, they all kind of come from common predecessors. If, while, for, things like that. Then there are functions. Functions are not keywords. The word print is not a keyword. But it is a function, meaning that somewhere there's some code defined that you can invoke by calling the word print. In Python, you can do things like this, which are not too good of an idea. You can say print is equal to 3. Then if you try to print something after that, I want to go home. Alrighty, so now that I'm going to run this, this line breaks the program. Because I took what used to be a pointer to a function, and I reassigned it. I treated it like a variable. It's no longer a function. That doesn't mean I broke the language. That I'll never ever again get to use the word print. But it sure does mean that in the rest of the program I'm not going to get to until that's fixed. So if you're giving variable names and they wind up either being purple or orange or whatever colors you set those to, you've got a problem. And there are times when you think that a, a word would be a perfectly good variable name and it's not. Like if I'm going to write something that's going to add a whole bunch of numbers together and store them in a, in a variable called sum, that's great, but then I'm overriding the sum function. There actually is a, a function called sum. If I don't want to do that, I need to change the spelling of it somehow. I could put a capital S on it rather than a lowercase s. I could pick another word. I could call it total. You know, Anytime you see a word pop up in orange, or purple and it was one you were trying to make rather than part of the syntax of the language then you know you've chosen a bad variable name there are other rules for variable names variable names cannot be keywords like if or while idle colors those orange unless you change the coloring also cannot be function names I'm going to change the word cannot to should not be function names like print or sum or else you run the ability to actually use that function later. 
You know what, if your program never prints anything, sure, use print as a variable name, but don't use print as a variable name. Your program may never use the sum function, in which case you type sum is equal to three. Your code works fine, but then you give that code to somebody else, they like it, they copy and they paste it in their program, and later on they do want to use the sum function later in the program, they can't because you're, you overwrote it. Okay, other rules. A variable can be letters, numbers, and certain symbols. I believe the symbols are underscore and dollar sign. We will test those out. I think dollar sign is not legal in Python. I think underscore may be the only symbol that's legal in a variable name. We'll test it out. However, it must not start with a number. So 1987 tax rate, illegal variable name. How do you fix it? You just put the number somewhere else. Tax rate 1987 is a legal variable name. Let's find out if dollar signs are allowed. Go back to our shell. So if I do a dollar sign is equal to hello, nah, that doesn't work. Underscores do. A underscore is equal to hello. That looks stupid, but it's a legal variable name. What are underscores used for? Well, back in old, old, old times, you couldn't use both uppercase and lowercase letters. Sounds dumb, but if you were typing on a screen in the 50s or maybe even the early 60s, you couldn't type in birth or my birthday is equal to whatever, June 1, because it had to all be uppercase. So you'd have to do this, my birthday is equal to, you know, June 1. That's great, but if you want to write clear variable names, sometimes you want to break these words up. So instead of just speed of light, is it going to 3.6.011 uh, to the power of whatever it is? I'm just going to do that. You might want to do speed of light. Makes it easier to read. You want to do that? That's cool. I don't recommend using all uppercase letters except in very specific cases. That's kind of amateurish. You can do it, and there are times when you want to do it, but usually you only want to do it for constants. Pi is fine to do as uppercase letters. Pi is a constant. If uh, you can change the power of pi, then, uh, then you're more powerful than I am. <laughs> Same with the speed of light. It's a universal constant. It's not going to be changing. Um, everything else ought to be in lowercase, but if you wanted to do, uh, you know, student age, that's totally cool. If you think it makes it easier to read, that's totally cool. I will say that the current generations of programmers for the past, you know, since about, I don't know, late 80s or something like that, have taken to doing it this way where you use lowercase letters, but then if you have an extra word that you want to make part of it, you make that a capital letter. Patient height in Celsius. Stuff like that. Rather than, um, you know, putting underscores between it all. That would work. This is known colloquially, I may have already used this term, as camel case. It's not uppercase. It's not lowercase. It's camel case because it's got humps in it. I swear I didn't make that up. So you can use underscores to make your variables more readable or capitalization. Patient height in inches or patient height in inches. I don't care which one you do. I just don't want you to use P. That's kind of lame. Or H. 
I use single letter variables sometimes in this class just because I'm typing an example. If I'm going to do A is equal to 3 divided by 10, why bother doing example value is equal to 3 divided by 10? And especially when I'm having all top code type code with me, the shorter I make my variable names, the better. So maybe I will use abbreviations. But if you put abbreviations in your in your code, in your professional code, and you have pH is equal to something, whatever, some people are going to think that that looks like the acidity, you know pH is a measure of how acid or how base something is. Instead, you use patient height. Your goal is to make your code readable even to people who barely understand the language. And you want to make it understandable to... You want to use whole words as your variable names rather than single letters, even if I'm not doing it up there. Just remember that. Good variable names are a sign of professionalism in programming. So when you're trying to make money from your programs, use whole variable names. If you're ever going to come back to it, use whole variable names. Oh gosh, who's the, the name of the, of the programmer who came up with Quake? John Carmack? Um, anyways, he took that graphics engine and has made probably a million dollars by licensing it to companies, you know, so that other people can write 3D games as well. You can be sure that he documented documents his code and he uses good variable names. Why? Because he has to constantly update it. You know, make it better and better and better. And if you can't read your code, then it's much more difficult for you to fix it. If you become a long-term programmer and you step away from your code for five years and you come back to it, I guarantee your eyes are going to bug out trying to figure out what you did. You're just going to think you're a lunatic until you actually finally see what it looks like. The more time goes by, the harder it is for you to read your own code much less somebody else. So if you make it readable by using good variable names and adding comments, you're a good programmer. All right, we haven't done an in-class assignment yet, but that's because this has been all review. Statements. A statement is an instruction. Typically, you have one statement per line. Some uh, programming languages let you stack multiple statements on the same line. A is equal to 3, print A. Even if you can figure out how to make Python do that, and I don't really think you can, don't do that. Other languages let you break statements across multiple lines. If you have a really long if statement, if A is equal to 3 and B is not equal to 4 and C, and you kind of reach the end of where you want to go, you know, C is less than B, and D is equal to 4, whatever, you know, like that. There's always a way to get that to work. I don't even remember what it is in Python. I usually try to keep my, pay, my uh, statement short enough that I, I wouldn't even be tempted to do that. But when I'm programming in a more complex language, like Java or C++, and my statements get past the end. What do I mean by more complex? Well, it, instead of print in Java, it's system.out.println. You can see that with if you have to type in tw two, twice or th three times as many characters to do the same thing, then I would very quickly fill up the amount of horizontal space I want to use for something. I'm going to see what if we can f figure out Python multi-line statements. Let's see if... Is it possible to break a long line to multiple lines in Python? You use the backslash. So this is legal. Total is equal to backslash 10. I don't know if the indention will work or not. Let's find out. Print total. Yeah. So if you ever want to continue something onto the next line, you use a backslash in this language. C++, Java, you do not. In basic, I think you do as well. 
You can see that whenever I have a question, I just Google up the question, uh, Google up the answer. Google is your best friend, or Bing if you hate Google. You know what Bing stands for? It's an acronym that stands for Bing is not Google. I'm kidding, but uh, nobody knows why they chose that name. Didn't already get past this stuff. So evaluating expressions. The computer evaluates expressions to figure out the result. An expression is a series of variables or numbers and symbols. Like 1 plus 1 is an expression. We know that 1 plus 1 is supposed to equal 2, but the computer actually has to figure that out. We know that the length of this word is 5, but again, the computer has to figure it out. There are times when expressions are a little bit more difficult to figure out than you want. For example, the formula to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius looks like this. C is equal to F minus 32 over 1.8. That's the formula expressed in nice mathematical terms. So you write your program and you type this. C is equal to F minus 32 divided by 1.8. It's wrong. You're not dumb for doing it that way. It's just wrong. What will happen is the computer will do this part first. 32 divided by 1.8. Then it'll subtract that from F. The same thing would happen if you typed it into a, a good calculator that lets you type in more than one thing before you hit the enter key. So this is not limited to computers. On the other old calculators, you know, you could type in F minus 32 equals divided by 1.8 equals, and that would work. But not with a, a scientific calculator where you typed in the whole expression before hitting enter, not in computers. That is because the order of expressions, or order of precedence. Multiplication and division have higher precedence than, than addition and subtraction. Whenever you look at something like this, you go, okay, first I have to see if we have any multiplies or divides. You go across from left to right, anytime you find a multiply or a divide, you know that that's going to be done before anything else. So whatever 32 divided by 1.8 is, I don't know. Um, but that is some value. That would get done first before we subtracted it from F. Is that what we wanted? No, we wanted this to get done first. If you want to change the precedence, you can use parentheses. And I know that, that you've done that on calculators. You want that to happen first, you use parentheses. That forces this thing to be done first, before the division. So parentheses happen even before multiplication. Also, exponents happen before multiplication, which is important. If you had this expression, c is equal to 2 plus 2, and you expected it all to be raised to the power of 3 like that, if you thought you could type that in, 2 plus 2, enter, okay, that's 4, to the power of 3, okay, that's 4 times 4 times 4, whatever that equals, then um, that's not going to work. Not going to give you the answer you want, because exponents happen before anything else except parentheses. So it gets treated as though it's written like this. If you want it to behave the other way, you better add your own parentheses to tell it. Even if an expression will be evaluated the way you expect it to be, there's nothing wrong with adding parentheses to make it extra clear. If you have this, A or C is equal to 2 times 10 minus 1, and you want to make it absolutely clear that this happens first, you don't trust the, uh, the next person to understand that, it's okay to put parentheses around it. It's better to have too many parentheses and too few within reason. This would be kind of stupid. 
The, under, the computer understands it. Let's make it even more stupid. There we go. <laughs> what happens? Well, this gets done first. Then this gets done. We still ultimately wind up with 40 minus 1. But you know, don't add too many parentheses, but feel free to use them even when you're quite sure that the computer is going to be following the orders of precedence here. Are you saying the computer goes by the number of parentheses first? It goes inside out. It looks for the innermost parentheses. So if the computer was going to, and here's my fancy word again, parse this, what it does is it goes, okay, what's the innermost level? Uh, that's a 40. Okay, I can take those parentheses off. Then it looks again. These two are actually of equal Value. values now. But, you know, that would get turned into 40. That would get turned into 1. That would get turned into 40. That would get turned into 1, and then it evaluates it. Does the computer understand the, uh, like the PEMDAS law? Yes, yes. It's programmed to do that. The language is. So, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Parentheses, exponents, multiplication and division, addition and subtraction, modulus, and floor division, which we haven't covered yet, I don't believe, also count as multiplication and division. But we didn't have modulus, and we didn't have floor division in junior high when we were learning, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. If, you, if there are no parentheses, then it just looks for them left to right. It looks for the first exponent, it solves that, then it looks for the second exponent. Then it looks for the first case of either one of these, and then the next case of either one of these. These are equal priority, so it doesn't really matter in what order they get solved. If you do this, C is equal to 10 times 4 divided by 8. It's conceivable that the language could go, okay, well, 4 divided by 8 is 0.5, and then 10 times that is equal to 5. Or it's conceivable, it would not be incorrect to do it like this, 40 divided by, wait a minute. Yeah, 40 divided by 8 is 5. Okay, same answer. Since these two expressions are equivalent, whether you do, it doesn't matter what order they get done, according to the computer, it just solves it left to right. That gets done first, and then that. Whereas if it was reversed, if it was 10 divided by 4 times 8, it still gets done left to right. That one gets done first, and then that. So within a priority level, within a precedence, it's left to right. This is making the concept of math more complicated than it seems to you already. You already understand all this stuff pretty much. You've already had classes where you had to worry about this kind of things back in junior high or high school or whatever. We're just explaining it in more detail than you wanted to know because when you're telling the computer what to do, you have to understand exactly how it's being calculated or you will get the wrong answer. If you entered this without putting the princess's ease there, would not work. I think that's enough about precedence. No way, no it's not. This is going to be our in-class assignment. Go ahead and open Notepad, or just open up Idle and create a new file. You could do it either way. I'm going to type some expressions, and I want you to tell... Oh, by the way, I made a, a goof. When I was showing that, that's not how you make an, an exponent in Python. You use star star. I'm just going to type some expressions, and then I want you to calculate them kind of in your head. So I'll try not to make them too hard.
I'm going to go back and put spaces in these just to make them easier to read. Now, honestly, when I'm doing exponents, I go ahead and cram them together like that. And that kind of gives you a clue as to what happens first. I really think that that pretty much illustrates all of them. As long as you understand that division works the same as multiplication and subtraction works the same. So we, we could throw some of those in. That's definitely not. Now I'm going to give you the answers in a minute, but I still want you to type this, and that's this way we'll have something to upload. Alrighty. Maybe you're not done with them all, but let's go ahead and go through them anyways. What's the top one? Yeah. And why is that? Because this gets done first. 3 times 4 is 12. Has a higher precedence, according to PIMDAS. I like to put spaces between them just to make sure that we know that the multiplication division are the same. So that's 14. What about the next one? It's 10, right? If you didn't get that, I can explain it. I can explain it pretty quick anyways. That's the first thing that happens. 2 times 3 is 6. How about this one? 14. That's 14. The parentheses make it real clear what gets done first. Why is that important? Because if we wrote it like this, it's a different answer. So the parentheses actually change the answer. How about that one? So 3 to the power of 2 is 9, times 2 is 18, plus 4 is 22. Did we all get that? If not, we can walk through it a little bit more slowly. Please let me know if you didn't. I'm staring directly into your souls. All right. Yeah, that one's 0, because this happened first. What's 20 divided by 2? 10. You subtract that from 10, you get 0. Then lastly, <laughs> 2 times 3 is 6, plus 4 is 10, minus 1 is equal to 9. All right, does that make sense? We're all good? Okay. There's a drop box for this. So go ahead and just do a save as. Give it whatever name you want. Expressions would work. Or call it in class D. It's a text file though. If you created it in Python rather than Notepad, then there's a trick you have to do in order to get it to save it as a text file. When you do save as you have to flip this save as type to text files. Otherwise, if you type in um, expressions.txt, 
it saves it as expressions.txt.py, which I would still take, but if you ever tried to double click on it, it would try to run it as a script. Word's cool. Word's the best of all, isn't it? All righty. So our homework assignment, as you might have guessed, you know, homework one was to write pseudocode for conversions. Homework two is just to implement those in Python. Ought to be pretty easy, but since it's not due Sunday night, it's, excuse me, Monday night, since it's not due Monday night, it's done due Wednesday night, then uh, you could work on it over the weekend, and if you have any questions, you could ask in class. That's why I broke it up like that. There's no due date assigned to conversions. Generally, things are due a week from the day they were assigned, or the midnight before. So, the due date for this one. I don't care. I don't care. As long as it goes in the right Dropbox, as long as you're not putting it in Kathy's Dropbox, you're good. Only Kathy's allowed to put them in there. <laughs> All right, so I've actually confused myself about the due dates. Yeah. I'll make them do both the same date. Nah. That one's due the 6th, and then today's is due the day after that. Or two days after that. All righty, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Or do I need to come back? Okay, just a sec. I'll be back there. All right, I'll see you all Thursday. I also have a couple of issues being a late enroll and I missed last class period. Okay. Um, what you can do I is watch the videos. I have the first three assignments done. Just upload but the, them. But the boxes are closed on them. That's not my goal. I will reopen them. Let me double okay. check that. Okay, I think okay. If they closed like 19th, 27th, and 29th, and I didn't. Okay, that if there's a due date, that's okay. You can, you should still be able to submit it, even though there's a date on it. Oh, okay. Give that a shot. Okay, okay. Because there's actually two different things. I can put a due date or a close date. Oh, okay. Perfect. I'll try. Thanks, sir. Sure thing.